Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the 24th Annual Board of White Conference. My name is April Julian. I'm the Director of Education for the CCLA. Many of you may recognize me as a guest speaker in your law or civics classes. Thank you to all your teachers for joining us, Thank you to all of you. We have a fantastic talk lined up for you, uh, but before we get to that, I just want to remind you all to uh, feel free to submit your questions and your comments in the chat box throughout. We'll have a, a Q&A session um, dedicated at the end of the talk, and we'll try to get to as many comments uh, and questions as we can in our time together. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, Michael Bryant, who uh, many of you saw yesterday during Justice Tullock's address. Michael is the Executive Director and General Counsel at CCLA. Prior to joining us, he was the 35th Attorney General of Ontario, the second Minister of Indigenous Affairs, and served as a member of provincial parliament for a decade. He's also served as a lawyer uh, at many different firms, appearing for all levels of Canadian courts. Um, and he's a graduate of Harvard Law School, Osgoode Law School, and UBC. Michael? Oh, Michael, you're muted. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, April. April is a master teacher and a great teacher. And if you haven't had her in your classroom, I say you must. Um, April also put this uh, event together, this conference together. She's the director of education at the Canadian Civil Liberties Education Trust. Uh, I'm uh, the head of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, but these two beasts are not in two different buildings. Uh, it's just uh, 10 people working together. And uh, one of them is, um, we're going to hear from now, uh, a quasi Ousu Bempa professor. Ousu Bempa uh, is a assistant professor at the Department of Sociology at the University of Toronto, and he's a senior fellow at Massey College. He has his MA and PhD from Toronto, and he got his first degree from Carleton. Uh, and so for those of you who don't know what a professor does, uh, he researches, he writes, uh, and he teaches, and he does um, other things. And one of them is, I'm very happy to say, that he is the uh, first uh, special advisor on anti-black racism to our organization, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, uh, which is um, quite a coup for us, and we're pretty happy about that. He's going to talk to you uh, about policing, and I'm, I'm going to let him talk about that. But what I want to start out with maybe is a question to him. And by the way, students, uh, in the Q&A, if you ask a question now, we might be able to answer it uh, at the same time or around the same time. So you don't have to wait till the end of the class. You got a question, start typing it in and we'll, uh, and uh, the professor will see it. Um, I'll see it, April will see it, and we'll, maybe we can answer it. So uh, professor, uh, how you're in the field of criminology, right? And uh, you're teaching at a university uh, how did you end up as a criminologist and as a professor, and how did you get into this field? What's your what's your story? Thank you, Michael, for that introduction, uh, and April and Michael for the invitation to be here with folks today. Uh, it is absolutely my pleasure. Um, I usually teach a lot, but I'm off from teaching this semester, so this is one of the first actual teachings that I've done this term, so uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and I will just reiterate something that Michael just said, which is, please, we will have a Q&A session at the end of our session, but as we go along, if anything that I've said is unclear, or you have questions that you're not sure whether or not I'll answer, please send them to us now. If it's something I'm going to touch upon, I'll just leave it. If it's not, this will give me an idea of what you folks are thinking about. So please, please, please use the Q&A and, and send your questions in. Uh, when I do lecture to my university students, um, I have it a, basically conversation style. I'm not used to sitting in front of a group for an hour or two hours and not getting any feedback from the audience. So please do use that. 
So um, as Michael said, I am a professor at the University of Toronto. I teach both downtown and at uh, the Mississauga campus, and I teach um, criminology courses in the sociology department, mainly around policing, around inequity and the criminal justice system. How did I get here? Actually, for much of my life, I wanted to be a police officer. I moved to Canada from the United Kingdom when I was quite young, I was nine years old, and my neighbor was a retired Toronto cop. He was actually part of the mounted unit. So uh, he had horses. Uh, I knew that he'd had a gun, a badge and a fast car. And as a nine year old who perhaps watched too many movies, I thought, um, you know, it would be very cool to be like this guy and, and chase uh, what I thought were bad guys around uh, for my career. And uh, you have to keep in mind as well that this is uh, from someone coming from the United Kingdom, um, where the police often wear those funny hats where they walk, or they, at least they did the streets more than um, uh, they rode around in cars. And so policing to me, at least as I saw it as a nine-year-old, looked like a very interesting career choice. So. I went to Carleton University to study criminology. They've got a great criminology program there. And uh, as it happened in my first criminology course that I took, my professor was a former journalist and he introduced me to a special series, uh, a weekend series that spanned across a few weekends in the Toronto Star looking at the phenomenon of racial profiling. And this was really the first time in Canada that we had empirical data so numbers and statistics to demonstrate that black people in particular in Toronto were disproportionately stopped and arrested for certain types of offenses and especially the types of offenses that only come to the attention of the police after a stop has been made, which um, supported the allegations that the police were being racially biased. And so at that point in my first year studying criminology, I had to make a decision. Did I want to become a police officer and perhaps engage in these behaviors myself or, or see my colleagues engaging in what I saw to be at that time rather troubling behavior? Or were there other avenues that I could take to try and you know, address what I saw as uh, issues of bias and discrimination within policing. And so I finished my undergraduate degree at Carleton. I came to the University of Toronto and I did a master's degree also in criminology. Uh, and from there I went to work for the provincial government and I spent a year first in research and evaluation. So kind of in the corporate um, offices of the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services, now called the Solicitor General. Uh, and then I became policing standards development officer. So that was working on operational policing policy. Uh, and what became very clear to me in, in that work was that um, although I was, you know, given the opportunity to work in, on some of the issues that I thought were important, uh, at the end of the day, I still had a, a, you know, a manager and a director and, and we had the deputy ministers and there were a lot of people calling the shots and dictating what I wanted to do. And so I went back to do my PhD and I became a professor. And one of the most beautiful things about being a professor is I, for the most part, get to choose what classes I teach. But importantly, a lot of my work, as Michael said, revolves around doing research and engaging with different organizations and sectors of the community. And I have a complete um, autonomy or I get to choose completely what issues I research uh, and I get to choose who I engage with. And so I have the privilege of, of, of now working uh, with the CCLA and, and getting to speak to folks like you. Uh, and I get to look at policing issues. And of course, one that has arisen recently and is the topic of our discussion today is uh, this discussion around defunding the police. So again, as noted, please, as we go along, post any questions that you might have in uh, the chat. We will leave some time at the end dedicated to questions. But um, you know, I, we're hearing obviously a lot lately, uh, a lot of people talking about defunding to the defunding the police. And to some people, this call makes sense. To others, it creates worries about um, you know, what might happen if we don't have police services and police agencies. And I think in order to make informed judgments about whether or not to defund the police, it's an important to understand what it really means and importantly, what led to these calls. So I think, you know, many people that are studying or paying attention to these issues recognize that the death of George Floyd in the United States over the summer, as well as those of Regis Korshinsky Paquette and A.J.S. Chowdhury here in Canada, have increased and strengthened calls for police defunding. Now, while these unfortunate deaths have made these calls louder, they're certainly not new, right? Um, we have for a long time, you know, folks that were the students today are in the GTA. For a long time, there have been questions about the 
consistently increasing size of the Toronto police budget. So uh, criticisms of the growth of the police budget are certainly not new. The same goes for other jurisdictions across the country. And in fact, prior to these most recent calls for defunding the police, both the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, which is a body of police leaders from across the country, so quite literally the associations of chiefs of police, while well, the police chiefs or many of them um, recognize the, the growth in police budgets and, and constraints uh, around money and, and what could be done. Uh, and so too has our federal government, Statistics Canada last year released a report. Importantly, what all of these uh, bodies and these reports have acknowledged, and this is part of the defunding the police conversation, is the fact that today we ask the police to do lots and lots of things, and some of them they're not necessarily well equipped to do. So how did we get here? Uh, I understand, and I'm going to ask Michael shortly to um, interject to connect some of what you heard from Justice Michael Tulloch yesterday to what I'm talking about today, but I'm going to start just with a little bit of background around policing. Uh, you know, when we think about police today, we think about a very formalized uh, organization or body. These individuals who, as I said, you know, drive car, drive around in cars that are are marked with police on the side and their and their numbers, and they have sirens. These individuals wear uniforms. They carry badges. They may or may not have weapons. And of course, they're given certain powers by the government to uh, arrest people and to do other things, including use force. Right. Policing is something that many of us take for granted, right? Um, but formalized policing as we know it now has not always existed. Now, you know, the word police comes from the Greek word polis or city-state. And there's a recognition there that as we've become increasingly quote unquote civilized or we've become increasingly concentrated in cities and large groupings that we've needed formalized ways to uh, what we might call engender public safety to, to ensure that our societies are safe um, and to identify and reprimand people who uh, act in ways that we deem inappropriate. In, in ancient times, policing activities were often carried out by people in military positions, uh, sometimes by enslaved groups, for example, uh, in Greece, and importantly, by collective groups of regular citizens who work together to ensure the safety and security of local people and property. So in England, for example, where modern policing comes from, historically, it would be groups of uh, men, of uh, able-bodied men of a certain age that would come together. Um, so, you know, um, in what were then called tithing, so groups of 10, and that group of 10 men was responsible for ensuring the safety and the security of the people around them. And on top of that was a larger group of a hundredth and then a thousandth. And this was where we started to see, you know, before modern policing as we know it now in the English speaking world, policing emerge. And so it would have been the responsibility of people like myself and people like Michael to ensure that our family and that our neighbors were safe and each of us might take um, turn, for example, staying up at night under the hue and cry system, for example, and the system of night watchmen. And we would literally stay up. And if, you know, something uh, nefarious or bad were to happen, we would um, we would yell and we would cry. And the other men within our tithing or our group of 10 men would come together to our rescue. Now, um, this system persisted for quite some time. But it changed drastically. And, and I'm, I'm talking here mostly about policing in the English speaking world in the early uh, 1800s, so the early uh, 19th century. And, and this was in the United Kingdom. And you heard yesterday, as I've said, from Justice Michael Tulloch about Sir Robert Peel and probably about Peel's principles of policing. So there we had in the United Kingdom, for example, as I've said, both the system that had existed where regular citizens were providing policing functions, but also to an extent where the military was called in, for example, when there was social unrest or riots or labor disputes. So I'm going to pause just for a minute. I'm going to ask Michael. Uh, Michael, can you just um, recap some of what Justice Tulloch said about Peel and, and, and policing? And, and I will continue on. Um, relating that to defunding. OK, excellent, 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 excellent. OK, so what, um, you know, Justice Tulloch underlined a point that uh, many of us might not be aware of, put it that way. Uh, he uh, talked about Sir Robert Peel's vision of policing uh, and uh, summed it up as police were citizens in uniforms. 
They were citizens in uniforms and that the public trust in police uh, was um, worked together in that the police had to earn the mm. trust of the people. So the police served the people and um, the, the people, if you like, were the boss mm. and they were all part of the same community and uh, hence uh, citizens with uniforms. He contrasted that with the the U.S. the contemporary U.S. model of policing, which is uh, which he called a paramilitary mm -hmm. model. And uh, he then made the and you know whether it's historically or sociologically correct, it probably is. He 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 had some studies done at the time for his own report, but maybe you can speak to this, or or maybe it's for another class. He said that to a certain degree, because the two countries are, um, our cultures are so connected, even though we weren't getting a level of crime, uh, or even though there was no real justification on the ground for it in Canada, I, I would say there was no justification in the US either. Uh, we imported that paramilitarizing of uh, police as the model. So we went from citizen in uniform to soldier fighting the police and uh, they were out there fighting the bad guys right now this is a profound point and it's a profound point that um, continues today so after George Floyd's death after months after in the midst of uh, all of the calls for defunding and detasking of police City of Edmonton announced with great fanfare this new tank that they had purchased and it, you know it looked like an urban tank and this urban tank was literally a military instrument a military weapon and obviously it was to be used and it was the police police's weapon to be used how against the people so this it's not that we've lost our way and now we're coming back to the peel way mm -hmm. sir robert peel way and uh, to me it's very ironic that peel uh would be the um founding father of um of I i'd say progressive policing uh because the peel regional police is infamous mm -hmm. and i've worked with peel or I, i've i've seen it firsthand as a duty council and when i was attorney general peel regional police mm -hmm. have always um brought with them enormous controversy mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, so can you talk about uh, the, the paramilitarizing of police and the end of the uh, police officer as citizen with a uniform? Absolutely, and and that's great. So, uh, as Justice Tulloch noted, and as as Michael has just said, you know we can credit Sir Robert Peel, who himself actually was a bit of a controversial figure. Uh, he was very a very accomplished man. Um, he was a key figure in Britain's colonial government, which is why I say that he is somewhat controversial. Um, he was responsible for you know much of the management of the colonies and actually exported policing, which was first really developed in Ireland later in London um, to to Britain's colonies. But as Michael noted, and as Justice Tulloch would have discussed yesterday, a key element of Sir Robert Peel's vision of policing was that quite literally the public were the police and the police were the public, or the public were the uh, the people were the police and the police were the people and this was that is noted you had citizens in uniform and they got their trust uh, they they got their authority um from you know not only the state but through the um allowance of members of the public so you had to have trust and confidence in the public under sir robert peel's vision of policing in order for policing to be effective right and so here we see you know for example the police would be um quite embedded within the communities that they policed and we need to recognize as well that this was a time although london was a large you know it was a growing metropolis especially once you got out of cities like london people tended to know each other so the main functions of policing um, are to maintain order to enhance public safety to deter and to catch criminals and the police have always done more than simply deal with criminal matters but over time and especially through the 1980s and the 1990s as there were cuts to a variety of social services so so for example social welfare um, after school programs and youth programming uh, community centers and things like that 
once we saw cuts to those uh, spending, social spending in those areas, we saw we saw more responsibilities landing on the shoulders of the police, right? So we have cuts to mental health, we have cuts to homelessness services. Because of the cuts to things like welfare, we have more homeless people. And importantly, when we talk about this militarization aspect, and I hope not to confuse anyone here, but in the 1980s and the 1990s especially, but really, I guess, stretching back to the 1970s, we also in the United States had the introduction of the war on drugs and the war on crime. Right. And that very literally, if you think about any time that you have a war, right, you have an us versus them, right, you have an enemy. And so what we started to see was, first of all, as noted, the increasing militarization of policing. So in the United States, they quite literally have a system where old military equipment, military equipment that's no longer being used by the military could be requested, downloaded for free to police agencies. And so, you know, Michael talked about um what had taken place in edmonton they purchased that uh, there's a famous example of a, a town called keen new hampshire who was able to get a very similar military vehicle i think it was a bearcat they applied to the uh, the uh, department of defense in the united states to get a hold of this uh, bearcat and they said they needed it in order to protect their annual pumpkin festival from terrorist attacks. Now, I, I don't know a lot about terrorism, but my guess is that a, a pumpkin festival in Keene, New Hampshire is probably not very high on the list of places that folks are gonna target, uh, but that was used as justification for um, giving Keene, New Hampshire this tank. So we have again, and I'm gonna just slow down so we, we can follow along. We have in the 1980s, starting 70s, but 1980s and 90s, cuts to social services, so to social welfare, to a lot of like youth programming, to mental health and, and supports. Um, we have the introduction of a war on drugs and a war on crime and an increased militarization of policing. And at the same time, of course, as well, you know, people start to become less connected to one another. And this especially ramps up in the 1990s and in the 2000s with the introduction of the internet. So again, if you think back to when policing originated, people knew one another much better, right? Our society, were less complex, we had more connection to people in our physical environment. And so we could engender public safety in a way that we can't now. And so there are two key concepts to consider, formal and informal social control, okay? Now I wanna pose a question and I, I hope, I'm not seeing many come in, so I hope I'm not boring you. I'm certain that I'm not, but I hope I'm not. Um, I would like to ask, can anyone, does, can anyone uh, tell me what they think informal social control might be? And these are, you know, the institutions that control or influence our behavior. So what are the types of organizations or institutions that are out there that influence how we act and how we behave? And I'm gonna pause for a second and um, wait for the flood of responses to come in. What are some of the organizations or institutions that influence how we behave? Well, I'm not seeing any, so I will carry on. So informally, we can think about things like schools, right? We can think about things like after school programs or sports teams, or we can think about things like both, oh, here we go, I see a new. Schools, thank you, exactly churches schools family sports teams right when you've got a coach when you've got teachers that you might like when you've got your your parents right churches so and and anonymous uh, there's anonymous someone just said churches comma laws so informally schools churches families as i've said sports programs and other things like that that were associated with would have had an would have informally had an effect of controlling our behavior. <laughs> Michael says my big sister, most definitely. Now on the other side of that, we've got laws, right? And that's what we would call formal social control. So we have a system of laws. We have the police to enforce those laws. We have um, courts and judges to decide whether or not those laws have been broken. And we have correctional systems to punish and rehabilitate people who have broken the law. Now, the reason I say this is because over the same time where we have 
you know, the increased militarization of policing. We have um, uh, increasing calls around and, and a push around the war on drugs and the war on crime, right? Um, and we have cuts to social services. We see, as a result of other changes in our society, less informal social control, which results in the need for more formal social control. So the police become or begin being asked to, as I've said, provide more of, of, of these, uh, uh, not only law enforcement, but general public and community safety functions that we ourselves can facilitate. And um, some of the teachers out there and Michael might appreciate, you know, when I was growing up, you'd often see signs in, in, in neighborhoods for the neighborhood watch, right? Like it literally had community members that would come together to, to watch out for neighborhoods. This is a form of kind of informal social control. Uh, in, in the smaller communities and especially rural communities, people still know each other, right? And so when uh, a, a young person's misbehaving, they know that the people watching know their parents and they might be able to go and tell their parents what they're doing or they might, you know, get them in trouble themselves. But we have less of that now. So we've got more policing. So this is a lot of background to talk about defunding the police, right? Because that's the question. So what do we have? We've got these cuts to social services. We've got increased reliance on police. And of course, as well, because of some of the cuts to social services, we also have an increase in certain types of problems, right? So mental illness um, has become certainly more prevalent in our society, but we have less in the way of services to deal with people who are suffering from mental health problems. We know homelessness, again, because of cuts to both mental health services and other social welfare programs has become a, a greater and more of a, a public problem and mental health and of course, um, homelessness uh, often go hand in hand. We saw an increased police involvement in things like youth programming and, and in schools. And we've just, of course, had announcements um, within the last couple of years, the Toronto District School Board has taken the police out of schools. Peel Region has just said that they would take place out of schools, okay? And as well, as I've said, we have this war on drugs. And so instead of treating drug um, and addictions problems as health issues, we've treated them as crime problems. And this creates a number of issues. So again, I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna have a think about what are the powers that police have? When the police arrive on the scene or when the police are called, what are some of the unique powers that they're able to exercise that nobody else typically is? And I will again, I'm going to stop and I would like you guys to provide me with some of the some of your thoughts. What powers and authorities do we give the police that we don't give any other members of our society? Powers of arrest and detention. Thank you, Michael. So most definitely. Any others? What else can the police do that that other people do or, or can't do or can't do at least without getting in trouble? Able to act with violence, go into your home. So and, and these are the, the, the key ones that uh, I'm thinking of stop and detain. So they're able to stop, to detain, to arrest, and ultimately those things can lead to what we would call criminalization, right? So they can arrest someone, they can charge and arrest, arrest and charge someone, and if that person is found guilty in court or they plead guilty, then they ultimately might have a criminal record. And of course the police can use force. And so I'm talking about this in the context of defunding the police because Calls for defunding the police, def calls for defunding the police have come from a recognition that we often ask the police to do things that they're not very well equipped to do. So the police, although we might give them some training around mental health, are not very well equipped to deal with people who are suffering from mental or who are in mental health crisis or suffering from mental health distress. The police are not really the uh, best positioned organization to deal with issues related to homelessness, right? Um, there's little the police can do other than give homeless people tickets and, and ask them to move on, right? They don't necessarily have access to the types of services that we might want homeless people to have. When we 
deal with um, issues of drug use and drug abuse as a crime problem, right? Uh, many people who are suffering from uh, issues related to addiction have a host of other problems that once again, the police are not well equipped to deal with. When we have the police in schools, um, teachers and administrators might be more likely to ask the police to deal with problems that they would otherwise themselves deal with. And so the consequence of these are one, a large amount of spending on policing that could be going to other organizations and institutions. And here in Canada, in many of our large cities anyway, we have some of the best paid police in the world. And that's a good thing because the better paid um, police are, the less likely they are to in, engage in corrupt behavior. So if we paid our police less, they might be you know, more inclined to engage in behaviors that we wouldn't want them to engage in. But what that also means is that when we have the police doing work that could be done by other social service sectors and institutions, that we're paying too much for those things to be done. And ultimately, not only are we paying too much for them to be done, but there are also a, a host of negative consequences that come along with those. So defunding the police, in fact, means a lot of different things to different people. So on one end of the spectrum, defunding the police really means police abolition. So take all the money away from the police. We don't need police anymore. Um, to some defunding means, OK, we need some reforms and perhaps we want to take some of the money away from the police. I prefer to use the term detasking the police. And so what that really describes results from this recognition that we in some instances have the police doing things that they're not well equipped resourced or positioned to do and many police leaders and even police officers will acknowledge this and what we should be doing is looking at for other organizations or institutions or creating other organizations or institutions who are able to perform these functions and taking the money that we give the police to do those jobs and giving it to those other folks so that the police can focus more squarely on the types of things that we want the police to do. Because as I've said over time, we've asked the police to do more and more. And unfortunately, we have some negative outcomes associated with that. So what do you guys think? Does this make sense? And what else can we think about when we think about defunding the police? What are some of the issues related to defunding the police, perhaps that I haven't talked about, or what concerns do you guys have? I'm waiting for all of those responses to come rolling in again. What does defunding the police actually mean to you? And uh, are you supportive of it? Does it concern you? And if it concerns you or you're supportive, why so? Why do you feel that way? So that's a good question from Michael. What if the existing police community refuses to work with the detasking agenda? How can we do this without them? Or should we be doing this without them? And this is something that's also emerged in Toronto, for example. So there have been calls to detask and defund the police. And there are, of course, already a number of what we might see of, as negative consequences coming from this. So in certain jurisdictions in the United States, these calls for defunding the police have been uh, met with a variety of different responses. For example, some jurisdictions have already committed to taking money away from the police and, and giving it to these other social service sectors that I've discussed. And again, I'll put it to you, but I'll, I'll keep on speaking while I, I talk about this. We can think about like, why would that be problematic? Why might it be problematic that we just take money away from the police today and we give it to other agencies and, and other sectors now and what are the types of things that we might need to think through right these are the questions we have so in Toronto for example there were two city councillors uh, Councillor Matlow and uh, uh, Wong Tam who 
um, we're pushing for a, I believe it was a 10% decrease to the Toronto Police Service uh, budget. And while I was uh, supportive of an examination of defunding and detasking, I was not in support of what they were suggesting we do. And there were a couple of reasons for that. First of all, 10% was an arbitrary number, right? At the moment, if as a professor, I were wanting to look at defunding and detasking the police, I would first want to know exactly what is it that the police are currently doing. And we know, and we hear oftentimes that the police spend a lot of their time dealing with people who are suffering from mental illness. In fact, a significant proportion of police calls for service and, and the time police spent uh, please spend in, 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 in public and, and working communities are dealing with people who suffer from mental illness. But in Toronto, for example, we still don't have a great idea of how the police spend their time. And without a great idea of how the police spend their time, we don't actually know how the money that we're giving the police is being spent. And so I would like to see personally an itemized breakdown and a, and a rundown of police calls for service over a given year and the amount of time that the police spend in any of those specific areas and doing those types of jobs, right? If, if we don't do that, of course, it's difficult for us to determine how much we should, if we should at all, be taking from the police and giving to other areas. But there's another, you know, kind of more important concern. That is, if we simply take money away from the police right now and we give it to other agencies, what's gonna happen in the short term? Because Oftentimes, and again, I'll take a step back and just think about the issues that we're talking about here. So we're talking about issues of uh, related to mental illness. We're talking about issues related to homelessness, to drug abuse uh, and, 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 and misuse. Um, there's also a, a large issue around race and racism, of course, which we have not yet addressed, but is serves or, or, or forms the key part of the work that I do. So as a, as a scholar, much of my work focuses on race and racism within the criminal justice system. So um, a, a key concern that I would have as well is that at the moment, many of the ways in which we deal with very real crime problems, and I don't want to scare people, uh, we, have, we are one of the, large, the safest large cities in North America, okay? So Toronto, although we have um, uh, a large population. We are a very safe city by, you know, North American and really by international standards. But certain pockets of the city do have very real uh, problems related to the types of street crime that the police often respond to. And so if we don't have, it's not to say that the police response is necessarily the best response, but police presence and police response to certain types of crime is most definitely necessary, right? And if we just pull money from the police without thinking very carefully about how we would fund these other organizations and how they would go about their jobs, then we might see a host of problems in the short term. And so this really, if we were going to look at defunding the police, would be something that we would need to do um, looking both at short-term and, and longer-term responses. When we look at issues of, of crime and especially violence amongst you know, some of our more marginalized populations, we might want to look at what we would call upstream factors. So not looking at the instance of violence themselves, but the things that have happened in those persons' lives, either in the shorter or, or the further back period that have contributed to their involvement in crime. And this is for folks that are interested, for example, there's the Roots of Youth Violence report that was published in 2008, which was a study undertaken by um, Roy McMurtry and, and um, Alvin Curling, which looked at the root causes of youth violence and specifically looking at um, the, the, the Toronto and the Ontario context and identified a number of kind of social factors that contribute to youth violence. Well, in the short term, police presence in communities and police, pres police responses to violence can keep violence down a bit. It's certainly not a magical solution, but it can keep violence down a bit. If we just take money away from the police and they're not able to do some of that work anymore, and we just give it to other organizations and institutions, then that can be problematic. And so we, we would be wanting to look at a multi-pronged approach here. I'm seeing a question or a, a, a statement coming in here. Uh, definitely supportive of defunding and detasking the police and agree with including the higher skilled professionals in areas like mental health addictions and homelessness, et cetera. How quickly do you see Canada or Toronto moving towards this? And can we, what can we do as citizens to push this? So that's a, that's a, a very good question. 
So, and there are, are, are a couple of, um, you know, we can look at Michael's question here as well. What if existing police community refer, refuses to work with the detasking agenda and how can we do this without them? So uh, I started off by saying, I think in order to have a, a, a sensible and intelligent discussion about defunding or detasking the police, we need access to data. And I'll talk shortly also about access to race based data, because, of course, you know, racial bias and racial discrimination has been a big part of the reason that we've had a push for this defunding and these, de this detasking movement. But as I've said, we need to have a good idea of what police are doing in any jurisdiction, how much of their time is spent doing certain things and especially the things that we don't want them to do. And once we have a good idea of how much time they're spending doing those things, the largest line item or the largest component of any police budget is salary, right? So the more time that police are spent on um, dealing with a problem or dealing with an area or a given community, the more of the police budget is going to deal with that problem, that area or that community, right? And so once we have a decent idea, time-wise and 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 task wise of what the police are doing we can then start to see okay well you know 40 percent of their time and therefore uh, 40 percent of of the uh, salary is going to deal with this how can we better align that with respect to the question here detasking uh, and 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 the police community what if they refuse one of the things that i think is important to note as well is that police officers themselves experience a number of adverse effects from engaging in things that they're not well uh, equipped or able to engage in. So we can think around um, mental health and homelessness, for example, right? Like the police are not well equipped to deal with issues relating to mental health and they often see things that can be quite traumatic. And so in Canada, for example, a police officer is much more likely to take their own life than they are to be um, uh, seriously uh, hurt or killed by a member of the public. And that is due to the high level of stress, um, strain and trauma that's experienced by police officers. So from the policing perspective, I think part of this detasking and related defunding needs to come in the context of officer wellness. How can we have the police doing things that they're well equipped to do and well supported to do and not doing work that they're not well equipped and well supported to do? What actions can we take, as the, the uh, question noted? Um, as, as citizens, if we're supportive of this, well, I think, you know, first of all, as, doing, as you're doing now, is engaging in these types of conversations to become better informed. And then, of course, it's um, asking those who hold certain positions of power, that would include our elected and our appointed officials, um, including our, you know, uh, members of city council, our mayor, uh, members of provincial and, and, and federal parliament, as well as appointees such as the chief of police to be examining these issues and to do so in a sensible manner, right? Um, and so, you know, when we educate ourselves and, and we can make informed choices and decisions, we can then apply pressure to, as I've said, those appointed and those elected officials to um, try and make the right decisions. From my perspective at the moment, and this is a part of the work that I'm doing with um, folks with the CCLA, is that I think that the current focus of the defunding and detasking conversation in the city of Toronto is actually too narrowly focused on mental health and, and not beyond that. And so I say that because, you know, police use of force is, of course, one of the drivers for this defunding and these detasking conversation. And so when we bring race into the mix here, a recent report conducted by, recent report published by the Ontario Human Rights Commission involving research conducted by one of my colleagues, Professor Scott Wortley at the University of Toronto, looked at police use of force in Toronto and how police force differed by uh, race. And so some of the you know, key examination was how black and indigenous people, but largely how black people experience police use of force in the city of Toronto. And one of the most interesting findings for me from that report is that when we look at white and black differences in police use of force, white people were much more likely to have force used against them by the police when they were either intoxicated or they were in mental health crisis, okay? So that aligns directly with you know, some of these key calls for defunding and detasking the police around mental illness, right? As I've said, some of the reason that people are calling for detasking or defunding of the police is because they deal with so many people who are in mental health crises or distress and they conduct wellness checks. And in so doing, those individuals are often seriously hurt or 
in unfortunate circumstances sometimes die, right? That is, I started the conversation talking about H.S. Chowdhury and Regis Korchinski Piquet. Those are two individuals uh, to whom the police were responding who were in mental health crisis who ended up dying. Now, those were two racialized individuals and they end up, they, they turn out to be outliers. What the research conducted by Professor Wortley and published by the Human Rights Commission actually demonstrated is that for the most part, uh, when black people have use, uh, force use against them in the city of Toronto, it's in the context of proactive policing. So the police, you know, stopping and questioning individuals as opposed to those responses uh, to issues related to, to, to mental health and, and mental distress. So I think the conversation needs to be expanded. We know that historically, and this has changed a little bit post-legalization, but uh, Black and Indigenous people in Canada, for example, were disproportionately likely to be stopped or are disproportionately likely to be stopped and searched by the police. And one of the key drivers for that um, has been the war on drugs. So the police assuming um, largely erroneously that Black and Indigenous people are more likely to be possessing and to be selling drugs than members of other groups, right? And so the more the police are stopping people, of course, the greater the likelihood that they will uh, end up criminalizing someone uh, and the greater the likelihood that force will be used against them. So I just want to give a little bit of recap. When we talk about defunding the police, right, those calls range from a complete abolition or removal of police forces to rather small uh, reforms to policing. I think when we take a middle ground, what we're really talking about here is having an examination of what it is that the police do, uh, recognizing that they do some things that they're not well equipped to do and that there are negative consequences of their involvement in those things. And once we identify those things and the amount of money that we spend on those things, we can then take that money, and this is where the defunding comes from, and give it towards, give it to other organizations or institutions who are better able to do that. And as I've said, defunding, the term defunding, I think puts off a lot of people, but we have to recognize that calls for defunding the police are coming in part because there have been calls, uh, not because there have been calls, but in part because we've seen the defunding of, as I've said, other uh, social sectors and other social institutions. So the defunding of, of, of mental health care, the defunding of social welfare have all taken place in our society. And, and many of those funds, uh, or at least the work associated with where those funds were, have gone to the police. So I know we want to leave dedicated time for questions, and I've spoken a lot. I will finish you know, kind of these comments with, from my perspective, I think we would be better off to have an examination of detasking and a conversation around detasking rather than simply defunding. Because although I think the funding element of this is very important, what's more important from my perspective is the defunding part. And again, there have been calls and conversations going on now for a long time about what is really the role and function of police in our society, right? What is it that we as civilians, as members of the public, want the police to be doing. And we can think about all the different things that they do. They direct traffic, they stand at construction sites, they conduct patrols, they're in schools, right? They're um, dealing with cybercrime and, and with terror. But there are all these different things that we now have the police doing. And we need to have a conversation about what should the police actually be doing? What can we do as, as members of the public to engender public safety and, 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 and community safety? Uh, and what uh, parts of this work can we give to other organizations or institutions? So I'm going to pause for a moment um, and, and just see what other questions. I see another question. Oh, why not just demilitarize every aspect of policing? And that's a good one. And please, folks, uh, send in any, any other questions that you might have. So um, I, I, the, the militarization part, I, I find an interesting one. Policing as an institution, actually, even under... Uh, Sir Robert Peel's envisioning of policing is still paramilitary, right, in, in terms of the hierarchy and its structure, uh, and in terms of things like the uniform. Um, from my perspective, I think the police need to be able to respond to any um, potential threat that might arise, right? So it's not that I would necessarily want the police to get rid of all of the weapons that they have and all of the forms of equipment that they have. But I think there needs to be a justified reason for having those weapons and those equipment and very narrow parameters in which they're able to come out. And so a lot of the police militarization and the rollout of militarized types of policing has come in the context of the war on drugs. And this is where we've borrowed some unfortunate elements of American policing. 
In the States, for example, it, well, and, and it happens here, right? These no-knock raids where the police go into, into houses in the middle of the night and um, they're in, um, they've got all kinds of equipment. Like in the States, they used to literally like drive through pe the front of people's houses or they would drive through and, and this uh, piece of machinery would come up and they would pull the front door, or pull the, the front of the house quite literally off. And, you know, there's some justification for those types of, of very sophisticated takedowns because they actually typically result in um, l less um, injury. But at the same time, and we've seen this happen both in Ottawa recently, and of course uh, with Breonna Taylor in the States, is that when that's done improperly, right? Breonna Taylor was was killed in the context of a, a, a late night raid because it was believed that her boyfriend, which turned out to be her ex-boyfriend, was involved in the drug trade, right? And she died. In Ottawa, a young man recently fell to his death from his balcony in his apartment building when the police went in. So. No, I, I, I see that as well about uh, see that as well as something that we need to talk about and we need to seriously consider. Um, what about uh, what about consideration of what defunding would look like for police and their well-being, re job loss from loss of funding? So this is a very good question. So from the policing perspective, so I think from my point of view, there are a couple of things from the policing perspective. One of the things that I, so first of all, again, I see this as a long term and not a short term. Um, goal if, if it were to happen. And so, of course, police officers retire. And so what we would do, for example, is as police officers retired or they left policing, we simply wouldn't hire as many police officers as quickly to fill those roles. One of the other things I would suggest, though, as well, is because, you know, as I've said, so many police officers end up being community liaison officers, have been officers in schools, have been working in youth programming. We would simply ask police officers who are currently serving police officers who don't actually want to be cops anymore if they would like to fill these other roles, right? And there may be, you know, some kind of financial implications uh, of that to them. Uh, they may need to retrain, but I think we could also ask police officers who don't want to be cops anymore because there are some of them out there who are, you know, career police officers but may want to do something else to, to move over. But that is that is a good question. And this is, of course, what the police associations are partly concerned about, right? Is what does what do calls for defunding or detasking the police mean to the police officers themselves? Can uh, question can other organizations tackle situations like active shooters, or would that still fall to police or to mental health experts? So this is a good, uh, very good question. So from my perspective, and this is just my perspective, we are always going to need police to perform certain functions in our society. And so if we have, for example, an, an active shooter. Um, in a public place that I'm going to want myself armed police officers to respond. Now, with that said, if we have someone who has a different type of weapon, um, for example, and these are, you know, cases uh, that have, have taken place in Toronto recently, uh, uh, a needle or a syringe, for example, uh, a hammer or some other kind of sharp. person is the only person there by themselves with that sharp weapon, uh, with that sharp or, 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 or something that could be construed as a weapon. This is where mental health experts may be able to play a role in talking people down, right? So um, again, I think the more mainstream calls for defunding or detasking the police recognize that there are certain roles and, and functions that we want the police to do. Again, this is why I said we need to have a, a, a conversation about what the role and function of the police in our society is going to be. And from my perspective, if we now have the police doing, and you can't see my screen, but everything from over here to over here, how do we get the police, like in a sense, staying in their lane, right? And doing the types of things that we would want them to do. And so that would be, you know, responding in the short term to very serious instances of crime, of course. And we know that we can deal with the upstream factors or the root causes of crime and, and disorder and ultimately have less in our society. And, uh, and so we can fund programs and services that, that in the long term are going to reduce that crime and that disorder and that violence. And in the short term, we'll need the police to respond to that. We're also always going to have, you know, people, when we look across the world and across time, we have people who come together in, you know, very sophisticated or less sophisticated forms of criminal organizations to engage in criminal behavior, right? And so we, we are going to want police in, in a variety of 
different kind of formats to deal with that. And I think importantly, we can look at some others. We can start to then look at other forms of, of crime and criminal activity as well, right? Um, with our focus on street crime and, and the types of things that we typically think about the police focusing on, we actually missed a lot of other types of crime. We haven't talked about white collar and corporate crime, for example. So in Canada, you know, there's what's called snow washing. We have a lot of um, laundering of money for criminal organizations in this country. And uh, the RCMP actually just announced that they were disbanding some of their corporate and their white collar crime bureaus. And, and these white collar criminals and these corporate and, and some of the more organized criminals have a, a very detrimental impact on Canadian society as well, right? Both through things like uh, environmental pollution, um, but also they end up facilitating or supporting kind of the lower levels of crime that we see on the streets. What can communities uh, do to keep themselves safe in general and from the police? Uh, I, I think, uh, as I've said, um, part of the issue, part of the reason that we have less social control in our societies now is in part because people are more connected online and less uh, connected, <laughs> nice hat, Michael, uh, less connected um, to one another. And so I think if we can increasingly connect to those around us, right uh, to people around us we can engender more informal social control when you know especially young people know for example that their neighbors are looking out for them but also watching what they're doing and 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 keeping them accountable i think that is good and, and if those young people are less likely to engage in criminal behavior when they're young they may be less likely to graduate to more serious types of crime uh, from the police how do we keep ourselves safe from the police I think having a good understanding of what our rights are, what the roles and responsibilities of the police are in a very practical way when it comes to keeping ourselves safe from the police, recognizing that in the streets, unfortunately, oftentimes the police have much more power than we do. And so the streets may not be the best place to um, strongly exercise your rights. You most certainly want to know your rights. And, and you know, Michael's hat is a good indication of not incriminating oneself or those around them, but being aware as well of the uh, other institutions and organizations that we have that provide police oversight. So the Office of the Independent Police Review Directorate, uh, we've got the Inspectorate of Policing um, uh, that is emerging. We've got a few more questions here. I like these uh, rolling in. Um, is any evidence or research about how often police actually require an armed raid or actually require a SWAT team because they're otherwise outgunned? Uh, I don't know that off the top of my head. I would say in terms of the being outgunned, very, very, very infrequently, extremely infrequently. Um, requiring the SWAT team, yeah, um, you know, uh, the, the require an armed raid, I, I think again, in some circumstances, as long as the intelligence is there, you know, the armed takedown is not the worst. So going into an apartment or into a building or apprehending serious criminals, either in the act or as they're preparing to engage in criminal activity, because the more prepared and precise that is, the less likely they're, they're uh, less likely um, collateral damage is going to take place. But again, uh, it needs to be done in, in, a, in, a, in a very calculated uh, manner. For those that have made huge cuts to social spending, for example, the Conservative Party, but ex uh, exclusively, not exclusively, do you think it will be difficult to convince them to increase funding in the areas that are necessary for detail? I, I think this is, this is um, a very good question. So what do we do uh, with those uh, political uh, parties and, and, and with those segments of society who think that the police response is the right response to all social ills and 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 can we or should we be trying to convince them otherwise i think the evidence is there to demonstrate right and police leaders uh, bill blair um, who's now an mp but was the chief of the toronto um, police you know have, have said we're not going to arrest our way out of many social problems right there's an acknowledgement there for a long time in Canada and elsewhere, it's been very politically advantageous not to be tough on crime. So in the last 20 years, for example, liberal governments, NDP governments, uh, or parties, liberal parties, NDP parties, and conservative parties, at least at the federal level, have all supported what could be uh, viewed as tough on crime agendas, right? Thankfully, we're starting to see a rollback of that. Um, with respect to the, the more conservative elements, I think the way to um, have an intelligible conversation with a, at least a fiscal conservative, so someone who's concerned about fiscal or monetary responsibility, is to acknowledge that 
um, not only are, are, are police not well equipped to deal with certain social problems and that we have these negative consequences of um, criminalization and use of force, but importantly, we're wasting money. And you can't be a fiscal conservative and be supportive of policies that um, are, are not fiscally responsible. We have we had one minute left. Now I see April's face coming to cut me off. Um, thank you guys very much. I really appreciate the questions having rolled in. Uh, what this tells me is that uh, we need to do this again, and I most certainly would welcome the opportunity to do so. I will say I've done a little bit of, of writing and certainly speaking about detasking the police. Uh, everything, you guys are a bit older. I did something for CBC Kids, but I, I, I won't point you in that direction. But if you Google my name, uh, Akwasi Owusubepa, and defunding or detasking the police, or just police, uh, you'll find my, my stuff. And you can follow me on Twitter, at AOBempa. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.